Right, so let's look at what makes containers possible. What makes it possible to run this process in isolation that we just looked at here is just one or two processes running in isolation and without an overhead of booting that complete operating system. How is it possible to do that? You were wondered about it. Now, the answer to that lies in the Linux kernel. Linux kernel is where, you know, which offers us these features which make it possible to run this process in isolation or a sandboxed environment. And now, with the recent version of Win Windows servers, Windows has modified the kernel to support these features that Linux kernel had, and that's what makes Windows containers possible. Now let's look at which are these features which make it possible to do that. And the first feature is the namespaces. Now what I mean by namespaces is what you see here, the processes are running in isolation. They're actually running on a VM, but it appears as running in isolation because these are namespaces. So what you have inside the con uh, container is a set of PIDs or process IDs for your own process itself. And that gets mapped to certain PIDs. So this actually gets mapped to some PIDs on the host system right here. So inside containers, it's one, two, three, four, the PIDs that you see here. They're actually mapped to the processes right here on the host. So they are running on the host, but they're still running in a sandboxed isolated environment. That's the PID namespace. And then there are a bunch of other namespaces which make it look like and feel like a virtual environment just like running a VM. And that's what isolates one container from another one or one process rather from another one in a sandboxed environment. And what are the namespaces? There is a file system namespace. So each container can have its own operating system or the file systems. Uh, each container can have its own network namespace. So it can have its own IP address that you see here and the interface. Each container can have a UTS namespace is for the host name. So it can have its own host name. It can have its own PID namespace that I, that I just showed you. And recently, we can also create user namespaces. That's an important security feature because earlier, if you were a root user inside the container, if you could break out of the container, you could gain the root access on the system, but it's no more possible because you can map it to a non-root user on the system, even if you break out of the container. So that there's an isolation, there is a namespace around it. So that uh, that's an interesting one, right? And that's what makes running processes in isolation possible. Now, when you run this process in isolation and launch multiple containers on the same host, there is a possibility that there is one container which has a memory leak, for example, and then it affects rest of the system or other containers running on top of that, right? And that's where Google's contribution to the world of container comes into play, which, is, which was called as process groups, but now known as C groups or control groups. And what control groups allow you to do is control, as the name suggests, control the resource utilization and keep a tab or a limit on uh, the memory, CPUs, and so on and so forth. So even if you're running multiple containers, just like VM, you can assign those containers a certain amount of memory and certain shares of CPUs uh, on, on, the, on the host system that it is running on. Apart from controlling the resources, C groups are also responsible for collecting the metrics and that's what is used in most of the monitoring systems uh, which are used to monitor the Docker containers and the Docker environments mainly the stats UI, stats APIs. Apart from namespaces and C groups, which are two most important features, the file system that Docker has chosen is quite interesting, and that's what we're gonna look at here. Now, talking about the file system, let's again compare it with the VMs. So when you talk about VM, let's say you have an application. Let's say we're talking about a software delivery. So when you deliver your application to the customer, if you're delivering it as a VM, uh, you're going to have your application along with the runtime environment. So your application along with, let's say your app, app is 50 MB, and then you have some libraries, which are 100 MBs, and some binaries and dependencies, which form a, another 100 MB. And then you also need an operating system with the kernel and so on, which is about 200. So the complete image size is 450 MB. Now let's assume we 
upgraded our application from v1 to v2 what happens now is even though the changes that we make are maybe just 50 mb the application layer application part we have to build the complete image of let's say 450 mb in this example now that's what happens even if you change one single file on that vm imagine that right so every time you make a change you transfer 450 mbs now let's compare this with how it works with the docker in specific now when you talk about docker even though you have the image which contains the application and the runtime environment it, and it could form 450 mbs as well so it is comparable to vm in the size of the image itself however when you actually transfer it since you have made changes just to one component just the one layer when you transfer it you're not transferring 450 mb but you are only copying over just the changed layer that is 50 mb and that's what makes it very very lightweight to transfer so containers are not only lightweight to run as we looked at earlier it is also lightweight to transfer because of the file system that docker has chosen and the kind of file system that docker has chosen is called as overlay file system and that's what makes it really really interesting here and let's look at how it is um, uh, how, how it is formed right now even though you you have multiple different layers logically it will appear as one single image and when you transfer though it works as rsync works similar to rsync where it is just comparing the diff between what you have and what you do not have and just copying over the layers which you are missing there and this is possible because of the overlay file system that docker has chosen and to implement this overlay file system there are multiple different driver drivers and overlay file system supports layering concept there is another concept copy on write which we're going to look at next but this is implemented using different types of storage drivers and the choice of storage drivers typically depends on the underlying operating system that you have let's say ubuntu uses aufs core os uses aufs uh, red hat or centos generally uses either device mapper or butterfs uh, there is zfs or vfs as well which is possible right and that's another interesting concept that docker has in terms of the file system that it has chosen now it doesn't stop there it gets even more interesting and that's what we're going to look at here let's say you have built an image which is about 500 mbs and when you actually create an instance out of that and this is for a vm so vm you you may have a template or an image or a ami or whatever you call it as that golden image and when you actually create an instance out of that image what happens first when the when the instance is launched is this complete image gets copied over so there is a replica which is created and the running instance will have the cloned version of your original image so it takes up twice the amount of space and second is when you launch an vm it takes longer because it is actually cloning that uh, disk basically right so that adds to the runtime or the boot time as well now how does it work with docker again it gets very interesting here so if you look at the way docker works let's say you have an image docker image which is 500 mbs but when you launch a container that is the running instance of that docker image it does not clone this image but it rather mounts it as a read only image right that saves you one is the time to take so that's the reason why when i launched jenkins it didn't take really long time it didn't even take seconds it was milliseconds because it did not clone the image it just mounted the original image as read only and it allows you to make changes though and the way it works is this is a, this is called as copy on write so what it does is it creates a read write layer or writeable layer on top of the existing image that you have so existing image is mounted and any changes that you make the if you are making changes to a file inside that image it gets copied over here and that's what gets written and that's what you write actually so it allows you to write it appears as a virtual machine but internally it's actually copying a file from that read only file system and that's how it allows you to make changes so this concept called as copy and write makes it extremely efficient to run those containers without taking up a lot of space as well as a lot of time and if you want to learn about copy and write i can point you to a 
uh, pointed to a resource here. So that's from the Docker's uh, official images. And this is an interesting technology. And all of these choices that Docker has made in terms of the underlying technology is what makes Docker a very interesting and compelling proposition for building and deploying your software.